how to be more confident. How can I be more confident? Confidence, confidence, confidence. I hear this word all the time. And a lot of times people think that you're born confident and that is not true. So today we have a very special guest who's going to help us figure out how we can build our confidence muscle in STEM and beyond. Janelle Lene is here with us and I can't wait for you to hear all about her wonderful story and how we all can be more confident. Hi there, this is Prasha Dutra, and I'm passionate about helping you unlock your true potential in your science, technology, engineering, and mathematics career and beyond. Less than a decade ago, I moved to the US from India to live my American dream. I took my engineering career to the next level by starting my own consulting and coaching company while thriving at my nine to five job money, time management, career planning, and personal growth are all things we'll discuss here. From expert guests and their stories to my own lessons, this show is an ongoing masterclass in how to believe in your brilliance and conquer your STEM career with confidence. Get a pen and paper and get ready for an education you wish you had in school. This is Her STEM Story, the podcast. Confidence is a muscle, and if you work on it, you can build it up. In this episode, we're talking to Janelle Lene, founder of Next Level Confidence, a keynote speaker, a confidence coach, and a podcaster. Janelle helps self-conscious women become self-assured. With her coaching business and her company, she started this movement to help women overcome their limitations, become clear on their purpose, and take risks necessary to live the life that they're proud of. Let's talk to Janelle and learn more about her amazing work and how you can build your step, your confidence muscle in STEM. Hi, Janelle. Hi, Prasha. Thank you so much for having me. I am pumped to be here, pumped for everyone that's listening. We're going to dive deep today, and I'm so excited. I know. And so this is so great. I know we connected on LinkedIn and so many other platforms, and your work has been so inspiring and uh, so uh, refreshing because, you know, this is a topic that has been beaten to death, <laughs> like confidence and all <laughs> about it. So I'm very excited that you're taking a fresh perspective on it. Before we get started, I know we're in the middle of a pandemic and I just want to make sure everyone in your family is OK. I hope your week is going well. Yeah, everyone in my family is has been healthy. Um, I actually did get COVID. My husband and I also we both got wow. COVID, but we were we were okay. It wasn't anything too terribly intense for us. And um, I mean, we're, we live in San Diego, California. So like we're outside in the sunshine all day, every day, all year round. And I'm not going to lie. Like if I was, I think there's certain things with COVID that made it harder for some people. So if you, I feel like if you live somewhere that's like really snowy or rainy, the weather can make it so difficult. And then also if you live all by yourself and you've had a quarantine totally alone, I feel like that or with children. I think those could be the the harder scenarios, but yeah. it's uh, my husband and I just have a dog right now. So it's like, we've just had a pretty, to be honest, like a pretty, uh, you know, not too bad experience as far as our personal story. But I know a lot of people have gone through a lot during this time. Mm. And, um, and so I, I have so much empathy for the people who have had a really hard time during COVID. Yeah. And I'm glad that you guys are doing okay. And, um, you know, it's one of those things that you know, it's an experience. If you make it through, it makes you stronger. And, you know, uh, again, our, our prayers go to people who may have uh, not been able yeah. to make it or uh, the families that struggled even harder. So yes. with that being said, uh, you know, confidence more than ever, because now people are questioning their existence. I mean, uh, COVID has given us so many reasons to uh, stop wasting our time and start doing the things that we really want to do. And so this topic is really, really amazing, especially for um, minorities of women who are not, you know, who were earlier, like, probably ignoring that and just saying, mm -hmm. you know, this is how it is. I, I was born like this. I, I can't be more confident. And so I'm excited to talk to you about that. And before we do that, tell me a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> I know I introduced you a little bit, but maybe yes. something that I may have missed. <laughs> yes. Well, um, I wanted to say, like, I listened to your, one of your most recent episodes around uh, mental health. And I think you hit the nail on the head, both just what you just said. And then in that episode around 
the fact that mental health more than ever is being, you know, it's time for us to pay attention in ways that we maybe could ignore before or put band-aids on before. And now it's like, okay, let's get to the root of the pain. Let's get to the root of what's really causing that, um, turmoil, the turmoil inside of you, like the, the questioning. So I, I think you really hit the nail on the head there. Um, to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm Janelle and let's see, I'm 29 years old. I started my company Next Level Confident a little over three years ago now. I um, have lived in New York. I grew up in upstate New York, moved to Colorado for high school and college, and then moved to San Diego all by myself, just for fun. And we'll get a little bit more into that later. Um, but I moved here almost, I think it's been almost five years ago now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I live in San Diego. I got married uh, almost two years ago. We have an Australian shepherd puppy and yeah. um, that's kind of, that's kind of me in a very brief nutshell. I love ice cream. That's something I feel like <laughs> everyone can connect on, right? Like what's your favorite ice cream? We all have a favorite. I know. <laughs> I love that. I love that I, for icebreakers. <laughs> like, what's your favorite food? <laughs> so that's that's awesome. And oh my god, the the you know in California, the weather and everything. Like, I'm envious. So, and also the food is so good because I live close to upstate New York. I live in Providence, Rhode Island. So um, we're just getting some some heat, which is nice. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I grew up in Ithaca, New York, so not too not too far away. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love the name of your company and all that you're doing. So with that being said, tell us a little bit about this concept of confidence being a muscle. What, how can we understand that? Yes, yes, totally. Well, what I want to start with is saying what confidence is not. So mm -hmm. something that confidence is not is that it does not mean that you will never feel fear. A lot of times when I host my workshops for women in corporate America specifically, of course, for STEM companies and women in STEM, I'll ask everyone, okay, type in the chat or come off mute and tell me what your definition of confidence is. And there's a lot of amazing definitions. And a lot of people will, a lot of women will write uh, doing something fearlessly. And mm -hmm. while there's no right or wrong answer, maybe that is your answer and that's okay. I would actually argue that I feel fear all the time and things that I do. Um, every step of the way of my my journey, I have been so afraid. I mean, I feel nervous right now, even, you know, being on this podcast, like, and I've been on, I mean, I don't know how many <laughs> podcasts, but probably hundreds of podcasts. Like I just still, you know, it's public speaking, right? And and so one thing that it's not is I think women get to reframe that you'll never feel fear, that you should be taking action fearlessly. Um, I like it. Fearless is like a cool catchphrase, but the honest truth, at least from my perspective, is that I feel fear the more I take action on the things that, that I take action on things that scare me. So of course I feel fear. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that confidence is not is that it means that you're, you have to be outgoing or you have to be charismatic or you have to have a um, extroverted personality. Mm -hmm. That's not what it means. There are there are confident people who are introverted or more quiet and love to be a fly on the wall. And there are confident people who are extroverted and love to be, you know, outgoing and loud, loud spoken. And on the flip side, there are people who are really struggling with their confidence and struggling with their self-worth that are also in both of those spectrums. So I don't think that um, extrovertedness versus introvertedness actually speaks to confidence at all. You just never know. You never know. And then the other thing confidence is not is it does not mean that you're constantly positive. There can be, especially I think within personal development, sometimes this like false positivity, or I've heard it called toxic positivity, where you're supposed to just be happy all the time, right? Like find gratitude, find gratitude, find gratitude. And I'm not saying don't find gratitude, but like crappy stuff happens, right? Like we go yeah. through life and it can be really, really difficult. And so I'm a huge, huge fan of Brene Brown and the work that she's done because I used to be the person who was always so positive, but almost to a, a fake amount or almost to like an unhealthy amount where I wasn't actually acknowledging negative feelings. I wasn't acknowledging stress. I wasn't acknowledging hardship. I would just... Mm kind of blow through it. And I know a lot of women who are similar to me, especially when you're a driven woman and you got a lot going on, it's like, we're, we're busy. You just got to push through, push forward and like 
yeah. move past the pain, you know, like just, you don't have time for that. So keep moving forward. And so I think sometimes people think confidence means being peppy and positive and happy all the time. And I also disagree with that. I think it means being vulnerable, feeling mm -hmm. all your feelings. Uh, you can't numb the bad without also numbing the good. That's what Brene Brown says. And so, um, it's being authentic, right? So, mm -hmm. so what confidence is in my personal definition, and I would challenge each listener right now, think to you, what is your definition of true confidence, right? It's not something that's just on the outside. It's something that's on the inside. What is that mm -hmm. for you? For me, it means truly believing that your life matters. Truly believing your life matters. That's what it really boils down to. And, and taking those risky action, even if you're afraid, even if you're shaking, even if you're sweating, even if you're like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. I'm freaking out. Um, take the action anyway, even though you feel, you know, that fear. And I think it's trusting that you're going to figure it out. That's what confidence is. It's saying like, okay, I don't know this right now, but I trust that I can figure it out. And it kind of goes back to, I'm sure probably every listener here has heard the stat before around the fact that men will apply for jobs that they're 60% qualified for or apply for promotions that they're 60% qualified for. Whereas often women only apply for things that they're 100% qualified for. And mm -hmm. so to me, um, it, it means finding some of that confidence that men have where it's like, I don't like to say fake it till you make it, but I would say fake mm -hmm. it till you become it. Just realizing that everything is figure outable. Every, trust yourself. Trust yourself to figure it out because you've figured things out in the past. I always tell my clients, like when we're working through these things, I'm like, T tell me about a time that you were really scared. You did something. You didn't know how you were going to make it work, but somehow you made it work and you actually ended up crushing it. And I guarantee every woman listening to this podcast right now can think of a time, even if it was like going off to college and you were scared as an 18 year old or whatever. Like there are so many scenarios that you might've felt fear. You did it, you figured it out and you thrived. And that is what confidence is, in my opinion, because it means even if you're taking risky action, even if you're afraid, even though you're sweating and you're like, my heart is crazy right now, but I trust I'm going to figure out. I trust that it's going to go well. I trust that I will end up thriving as I take that first step of faith. Mm -hmm. I love all those points. And I think uh, you made a really great point first on the extrovert and introvert side, right? Where, um, you know, this is a big thing in STEM because, you know, we did, I personally led a survey last year of over a thousand people in STEM, uh, mostly women, and then uh, come to find out that over 60% of them were introverts, right? Like they either had introvert tendencies or maybe they, you know, were were uh, towards the introvert spectrum, if mm -hmm. you will. And uh, that's only because, you know, of course, people are studious and they study a lot and they're not doing a lot of different things. And there's a long education that goes into this um, this profession. So with that being said, like a lot of my clients and people listening, scientists, engineers, worried that we're introverts. And so we just don't have a chance at confidence because, you know, for them, maybe a confidence looks like extrovert, peppy positive like you just said so i love that you said this is what confidence is not and i think this is important to remember in all settings for sure um and then you know your 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 points around the vulnerability part i think good leaders like the brene brown says you know good leaders are amazing at um being vulnerable and sharing you know uh, what they're afraid of and then bringing people along and Anisha here says, you know, she thinks everybody should listen to this, which is super sweet. And I think for sure, because again, confidence seems to be this big mystery. So with that being said, um, if I'm an introvert, which I know a lot of my listeners are, how would you tell them to one, absorb this new definition, like which is, you know, so somehow against of what they had um, previously thought and how would they get started with you know figuring out their relationship with their with their stem uh, with their confidence muscle <laughs> yeah well i think knowledge is power first and foremost so uh, to me it sometimes literally means reviewing that truth so for me if i have a limiting belief that continues to to pop up and make me feel like i'm not worthy or, or that something's missing in me that other people have and i find myself starting to compare myself to other people um I, I look that limiting belief in the eye and then I 
remind myself of the truth. And so what you start to do is you start to repeat that truth over and over and you can create a new neural pathway in your brain. So mm -hmm. if your limiting belief has been, let's say someone listening is listening and they're like, your limiting belief has been, okay, I'm an introvert, so I'm not very confident. So I will probably never really grow in my career because of this or something like that. That might be your limiting belief. That's a, a belief that you have determined for yourself and you keep re repeating it over and over. And so it's becoming true for your life mm -hmm. because you're attracting that as your truth because you believe it to be true. So on the flip side, the truth is, um, I'm trying to think how to word it. I mean, there's no like perfect way to word it. You can finesse it yourself and, and figure out how you want to mm -hmm. repeat it daily. But um, maybe something like, my introvertedness is a gift because I, my strengths are X, Y, and Z. I think it's really important mm -hmm. to acknowledge your strengths within that. What about being introverted is a strength? Maybe it's that you are a really incredible listener. Maybe it's that you're an incredible question asker because you're so mm -hmm. present in that moment with that one person. Um, think about what your strength is within your introvertedness. And then, um, and then repeating, I am confident as an introvert and mm -hmm. I am able to get, you know, X job or whatever it is that's your goal that this might be blocking right. you from. Because something I, I'm really, really passionate about teaching is how your beliefs lead to your thoughts, your thoughts lead to your actions, your actions lead to your results. So if you're not getting the result you want in a certain area of life, whether that be your career or a relationship or your health, um, whatever that result is that you're looking for, oftentimes you're not getting that result because you actually deep down have some subconscious beliefs that are holding you mm -hmm. back from truly getting that result. So if you believe that it's possible to get a certain place in your career or to make uh, a certain income, if that's one of your goals, which I think, again, I'm really passionate about helping women think about money and talk about mm -hmm. money and not be, um, you know, have shame or weird stuff around money. Um, and so going back to that belief, what is the belief? Retrain the brain and auto suggestion is basically taking mm -hmm. a placebo pill by repeating something over and over and over again, preferably out, out loud. So probably if you're listening, you've heard of affirmations. That's the idea behind affirmations. If you keep repeating an affirmation over and over and over and over again, then you're going to start to retrain the brain towards the truth. And that's the power of auto-suggestion. That's awesome. And I may know the book that it comes from, Think and Grow Rich, <laughs> by Napoleon Hill, right? Um, this this concept was introduced a lot, long time ago by this, this guy. And then I know so many people have actually benefited from it. But with that being said, I know, you know, again, to your point, like toxic positivity or gratitude or certain practices have been like sort of oversold without context or without a lot of, you know, um, like reality check where, you know, when things do go wrong now, um, would you agree that, you know, we need to either find ways to make these practices a part of our life in a way that no matter what happens on the outside, we're able to sort of hone in on these um, auto suggestions or, or these affirmations? Um, or what would be your advice to somebody who's saying, yeah, it's all nice and great. But then, you know, when I go to work, then it all just, you know, comes crashing down because other people don't see it in me yet. And I think mm -hmm. that yet is like so powerful. But, but, but we all feel so stuck in our situation. So how would you say that we can use affirmations, but use uh, different techniques to sort of get out of that you know, one, one is the limiting belief that we have, but then the other is the society that's actually like, right. Giving us more reasons for, for it. Too, right. right. That's a really good question. I, lo I love that question. It's so deep. And I think there's so many layers to it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there is change that gets to happen in our society, um, both within diversity of race and diversity of gender. Um, and so, and that's something I'm just so passionate about. And there's some just things that you just can't quite like, yeah, you can't just quite, quite explain. Like, um, for example, I know for a woman of color, she's going to face in STEM, even just apples mm -hmm. to apples, uh, much more uh, hurdles than I'm going to face as a white woman. And that yeah. breaks my heart. And it, and it really... Oh, it's been a topic I've been like pressing into, yeah. even though it's really, it's uncomfortable for me because, because I am white and, and it's hard because I feel like some sort of weird 
almost like, to be honest, like guilt or shame around like, why mm -hmm. do they, why do those, you know, women of color or, or any people of color have to experience what they're experiencing yet? I don't have to experience that. Um, and then looking at genders as far as, you know, men and, and women and how that looks in the workplace and just, mm -hmm. there is just some messiness to it and inequality and injustice and um, change gets to happen. And I know change is happening. You know, of course, I want change to happen sooner in all of those areas so that we can reach true equality. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that I guess it's kind of in the gray for that answer, Prasha. Yeah. It's like, I wish that I could say, like, just keep saying affirmations <laughs> and everything will be perfectly better. But you know, you can only control what you can control. Like you can control your own mindset. I can control my own mindset. And I just know, and we'll get into my story a little bit more, but I had such yeah. a victim mindset for so long. Like mm -hmm. I was such a victim to my circumstances and, and it really breaks my heart that I took that stance. And so I think that sometimes people take that victim stance and they don't realize that they're taking that stance um, and, and making the problem worse at the very least, like the problem might really be there. I'm not saying the problem doesn't exist. It does. Yeah. A lot of these problems exist, but we might be, um, you know, continually just looking for like that victim card. And I just think we have a choice of, you know, there's a yeah. problem and there's a challenge and it's going to be imperfect and it's going to be messy. And these, these inequalities and, and injustices are happening in society. Um, but all I can't control all of that. I can I can try to make a change, and I am, yeah. um, and, and you are, and and other women and and people yeah. of color, and all the all the different topics around right. diversity and and um, and gender diversity. Like there is change happening, and I, th I think I'm kind of like <laughs> like yeah, and I want no, to happen it's... sooner. Um, <laughs> But, but no, I think I think I think you mentioned some really great points. I think I think there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of change happening in America and a lot of things happening um, that are sensitive plus urgent at the same time. And and I think everyone's struggling a little bit to find, you know, some ground to have conversations or or move forward. Um, and I think again recognizing that there are certain situations that you can't control and then there's certain that you can and like focusing on what you can control because you know that's that's exactly what growth mindset is right like if i have a growth mindset that i'm always looking at something as a challenge opportunity and um you know it's another habit i mean it, it, it you you've been there and and I've I've been there myself where you know that was the habit like we always kept choosing um you know a negative thought or a victim mentality or victim outcome or something I'm not saying good or bad it's just what it is what it is kept choosing that and then found ourselves like a little bit more stuck but then when you realize that it's as simple as just cho choice sometimes um and especially for your mindset it's just a choice then how the world is that is a different story you know every generation has their challenges every just society has their challenges and i don't think we ha any of us have the answer to it it's just if we have one less confident person then it's like we are one step behind you right so if we are going to make that change we all need to become more confident and mm -hmm. say our whatever we want to say so i understand the you know the uh the turmoil in in the American society right now, um, but I also see some amazing work happening. It's really really nice, and um, and you know you you're right. It has to happen sooner, but it's okay. It it is getting there, and uh, with patience, I think we'll be there. But I think same thing, right? Like charity begins at home. Start with yourself. Start yes. with your family. You know, start with little things, and then don't try to like be in the battlefield for this today. Like it doesn't have to be that way take your time with it, pace yourself, because again, a lot of this work is a marathon, it's not gonna happen tomorrow. Um, so yeah, all those all those great points, and I love that. So with that, let's just talk about, tell us a little bit about your past and about your challenges. And I know there's you know some amazing ones there, which actually led you to this place. I always think challenges are so great. Like, I really like challenges. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Well, you had mentioned Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And um, I recently read one of his books called Outwitting the Devil. Have you heard of that one? Mm -mm. Yeah, I hadn't either. Outwitting the Devil was actually written about, I think, two or three years after Think and Grow Rich. Um, mm -hmm. But it was such a controversial book that it actually wasn't released. Like his 
his wife wouldn't let him release it in his lifetime. So then he passed. She outlived him. She still wouldn't let it come out publicly. Then she passed. Then the next person who took over the Napoleon Hill Foundation passed. They yeah. wouldn't let it come out. And then just recently it came out, I think in like 2011, after oh. I think 80 years of that manuscript being ready to be released, but it just got mm -hmm. released. And um, yeah, he talks a lot to the things that we're talking about here. And it's really, really interesting. So if anyone's looking for uh, a really interesting book, uh, Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill is really, really good. Uh, that said, diving into my story, Whew, where do I start? Um, I, <laughs> I like, I think I had already said I grew up in upstate New York and, um, and then we moved to Colorado when I was going into eighth grade and I did not want to move. I was always a super opinionated young girl. I had so many opinions. So I told my parents at the age of 13 that I would not be moving from upstate New York with them to Colorado. I had talked to a friend um, and I asked the mom if I could live with their family. And she said, yes, she probably was like, LOL. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure, you're, I'm sure your parents will let you, uh, live with us. <laughs> um, but I sat my parents down. I said, mom, dad, I won't be moving with you to Colorado. I'll be staying here in New York. And then I'll go to Cornell for college here in five years. And then I'll visit often. And they said, mm -hmm. Nice try, Janelle. Um, pack your bags. We are moving to Colorado. <laughs> so yeah, I did indeed move to Colorado. And I think it was within that transition that I think it was that was pretty, pretty big for me. And I'm grateful for it now that we moved a lot growing up or a fair amount because I think it helped me get used to change and and used to, you know, new schools and new people. The other thing is that I was homeschooled. And so mm -hmm. I think that being homeschooled for, I was homeschooled from kindergarten to third grade. I begged to go to public school because I actually am very outgoing naturally. I love being social. So I was like, let me be with the kids. Um, and so I went to public school for fourth and fifth grade. Then I was homeschooled again in sixth. And then, so I was bouncing around a lot between homeschool and public school, kind of back and forth a little bit and then changing schools with the move. So Anyway, I'm just I'm just going to go there. You know, there's only so much groundwork I can lay before like really diving in. But basically around the age of 13 or 14, after the move, I started to become pretty depressed and mm -hmm. I wouldn't have called it depressed at that time because I didn't really acknowledge my feelings at that age. Um, I was if anyone is into the are you into the Enneagram at all, Prasha? Yeah. What's your Enneagram? Um, eight, I think. I'm an eight also. Yay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. you an eight. eight woman. That's the best. <laughs> yeah. yes. Eights are like notorious for not feeling their feelings, not being vulnerable, um, being as tough and like, yeah, just tough as possible. So I did not feel my feelings, but I was definitely feeling my feelings because you can't just not feel your feelings. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to feel these really, these these depressed feelings. And, and what it was coming from was that I was always telling myself and repeating the story that I was different than everyone else. I repeated that story all the time. I would go to school, public school. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like, not like these kids. They're like so much more in the know than I am. They're cooler than I am, whatever. And I'm like, I'm different than them. Then I go, you know, to the homeschool crowd and I would hang out with them. I'm like, whoa, these kids are, you know, they're weird. No offense to anyone listening to so homeschoolers. Shout out to homeschoolers. We're awesome. But, um, yeah, I was like, these kids are a little strange. Wasn't really fitting in there. We were really involved in church and I'd go to church and I felt like I wasn't really like the really nice girls at church. I'm like, these girls are so nice. Like I'm, I've always been just so much more like, you know, a lot of personality, like a lot, a lot of crazy. I'm just crazy. And I'm like, wow, let's have fun. <laughs> um, and so I just never felt like I fit in. And I kept repeating that over and over and over and yeah. over again. I don't fit in here. I don't fit in here. I'm not like everyone else. And what's also interesting with this is that there was kind of this weird egotistical thing that would go on. And I actually, the best way I've heard described it was in Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. Mm -hmm. If anyone here has read that book, it's so good. But he talks about how when you're actually insecure, you do this weird thing where one minute you think your life is like horrible and it sucks and has no meaning. But then the next minute you kind of over inflate yourself and you're like, mm. I'm so awesome. I'm actually better than everyone else. Like 
no one else has anything on me, like that kind of thing. And it just is like this crazy roller coaster ride. And I actually see that in the most insecure people I know is that in one moment they like hate themselves, but in the next moment they think they're better than everyone else they're around in a way to try to protect and feel better. And so when you reach a true confident level, you actually you love yourself fully and you see your value, but you also see everyone else on that exact same level. So you don't think you're better than anyone else. You don't think you're worse than anyone else. You just see everyone on this equal playing field of possibility. And, you know, everyone, you're like, everyone's incredible. And I'm incredible. Like I'm a queen, Rasha's queen, everyone listening, you're a queen. Or if you're a guy, you're a king. Like everyone is freaking awesome. Uh, that's true confidence. But I didn't have that back then. I was, I was insecure and thought I didn't belong. And so I'm kind of dragging the story on today. Let's just get to the chase. No, um, basically I started to think about committing suicide and mm. I started to think if I went missing or if I died, people would really miss me. And I wanted to be noticed because I didn't feel like I fit in. So I wanted people to notice me. And so I started to think, okay, well, you know, what would my funeral be like? And you guys like, it's kind of crazy to share this, but basically I would, I would, picture how how my funeral would be and how people would come and say Janelle is, is so awesome like mm. and girls who like were mean to me in school they would come to the funeral and be like Janelle and I were like best friends and I would just picture them saying really great things about me uh I pictured it being packed I pictured everyone mm. crying and like I also had this like weird martyr thing going on where like from a Christian standpoint, I was like, this is God's calling on my life to, to die. And then people come to the funeral and like learn about God. You guys, yeah. it was so effed up on so many levels. It was crazy. Um, but I also didn't want to commit suicide, which I was considering, but I was like, I can't do that. That'd be bad. Everyone would be pissed at me. So then I started to think, well, what if I died of like a natural cause? Like oh, wow. <laughs> what if I could just die of something like a car accident? then no one can be pissed at me. Then everyone can feel bad and feel sorry for me. And then I don't have to be here anymore. I have to go through all this BS that I'm having to go through. So I started mm -hmm. to picture dying in a car accident. And I started picturing it over and over and over again. And it was like this weird ego thing where I would get to picture everyone missing me and everyone feeling bad and everyone wishing they had been nicer to me and that everyone wishing they had been friends mm -hmm. with me and that I'd fit it, let them, let me fit in or something like that. And like, you guys, this is like years of therapy, years of coaching, years of personal development, years of writing and journaling all these thoughts out because I didn't even realize this was my story mm -hmm. until like years later where I was like, whoa, that was going on. Cause it was so far back mm -hmm. in my subconscious. Like it wasn't like I would just sit there and ponder the thing all the time. It was like weirdly mm -hmm. living in a very, very back of my brain, but I never, never faced it. I never talked mm -hmm. about it. I told a few people, like three or four people, um, from the age of about 14 to 22. And that's how long I was playing that loop, that limiting belief loop. And so I told a few people, and the people I did tell would get really freaked out and they'd be mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, Chanel, don't think that thought. Like you should not yeah. be thinking like that. Like they, I, they were freaked out. Right. And understandably so, although that's why I share this story is because I want people yeah. to feel comfortable realizing like your mess and your like the dark thoughts and the crazy thoughts and the weird stuff you're going through in your mind is super normal. We all mm -hmm. think weird thoughts. If you think a weird thought, I always tell myself this. I'm like, oh, that was a weird thought. I should not have thought that thought. And then I'm like, yeah. well, honestly, I'm sure someone else has thought that thought. Like it can't be the first time a human in history has thought of such an interesting, weird thing. And yeah. so the more I've told this story on podcasts at all my speaking engagements, mm -hmm. like here I am speaking to McAfee or to Cisco and being like, I thought I was going to die in a car accident. I want to commit suicide. And then I'm like, so what are your limiting beliefs? And you want to know what? I have rooms full of women who are willing to spill out their guts of like the scariest stuff that they've ever believed possible for them because vulnerability begets vulnerability. So if I'm willing to just share all the weird stuff that went on in my mind, which like the car accident thing, pretty weird. But like that was me, that was my story for whatever reason. And and then now other women are like, oh, okay, so maybe my story is not so weird after all. And now we get to have freedom because when yeah. you keep your dark lies and those limiting beliefs deep down inside of you and you don't bring them to the light, you don't bring them to the surface, then they fester and they get worse and worse and worse and they boil inside of you and they can ruin you and they can wreck you. And so 
bring them to the light, right? Bring them to the light. Whether you have thoughts that are, you know, as dark and as uh, scary as my thoughts, or maybe your thoughts are a little bit less like that, you know, maybe it's a little lighter and and it's still a limiting belief and it's still something that might be holding you back. And so, um, yeah, the cherry on top of the story is that I finally told some mentors, right? When I graduated mm -hmm. from college, I told some mentors and they were the first people that it was a husband and a wife. And the husband said, do you picture everyone coming to your funeral? Do you picture everyone crying? And I was like, yes, yes, yes. And he said, I used to have that too. I was like, no mm. way. Like, I couldn't believe I wasn't alone. I couldn't believe I wasn't crazy. I was like, I'm I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. Like, it just felt so good to know mm. that someone else felt the same way I'd felt. And then he spoke life into me. He said, Janelle, you were born for a purpose. The creator doesn't mm. make mistakes. Your creator did not create you for death and to be planning for death and to be thinking these dark thoughts. You were created for life and life mm. to the fullest. And so... From that night forward, whatever it was, because of the way he spoke into me, instead of making me feel crazy, instead of making me feel bad for thinking these thoughts, he just empowered me to believe truth about my life. And so you guys, like if I had, I mean, I, you, as you can tell, I have got, I've got pipes. I could talk all day long, but like the amount of things that shifted in my mind mm -hmm. after that moment forward and everything in my life changed because again, mm -hmm. your beliefs lead to your thoughts, thoughts lead to actions, actions lead to results. So once my belief around what was possible for my life changed and I all of a sudden knew I could live my life till my, till I die till 90 or 95 or hundred or whatever my age ends up being. Right. Um, I was like, wait, what am I doing? So I like, I had been dating the same guy for six years, broke up with him. I was like, well, you're not my boy. You're not my husband. Like my future husband is not you. It's someone way better. So bye. And then I was like, I always wanted to live in California and I was in Colorado. So I moved to California. I want, I, I was two years out of college. I went to college for hospitality management and business thinking I wanted to be a wedding planner. I didn't give I didn't think at all about my career. I just chose something random. Mm. Everything I was doing at that time was random. I was like a hamster on a hamster wheel, just going mm. through the motions, waiting till I died. So once I could, once I got those blinders taken off, I was like a hamster jumping off the wheel and being like, Ooh, I'm gonna go do stuff with my life. And I just went and <laughs> did everything. I changed my career. I changed everything. So that is like the power of believing your life actually matters. And sometimes you have to hit rock bottom in order to be mm. like, propelled forward to have that experience where you're like, dang, I'm gonna go live my whole life to the fullest. Yeah, well, that's so powerful. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. It takes, you know, as you said, a lot of therapy, a lot of courage, and a lot of like, understanding yourself really well to be able to share that. However, when it's someone like you who talks about teaches confidence and, you know, um, and has that personality, it just does give everybody a perspective that you know we're all coming through struggles we've all gone through the lowest of the lows you, you can never compare one person's problem with another you know everyone's pain is very big in that moment you know um it's 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 just validates a lot of other people's thoughts and feelings as well and also gives hope that you know if if you can come out of that after so many years of suffering, um of course there's there's light at the end of the tunnel for anybody who's willing to go the deeper to recognize what it is that's stopping them, right? So I've had a very similar experience as you were talking. I was like, is she talking about my story? Like so similar, right? Like throughout my teenage, I was like really like the oddball. And I was, you know, uh, you know, in India, there's a, so many, there are so many like taboos and you can't do this, you can't do that. And, and I was always like this person who wanted to do everything that was not allowed to do. And I was just like, <laughs> like, oh my God, and I had the strict, strict parents and anyways yep. with all that being said I was like oh my goodness and you know personally I have had my share of struggles with uh, self-harm and I've tried to I've tried self-harm over six times and with that being said in 2017 actually or 18 was it right around her some story was coming was starting and things like that I gave a talk on that topic and this was when Kate Spade um Mm -hmm. uh, come, what died of suicide when Kate Spade died of, su of suicide uh somebody invited me to a talk and I'm like okay I'm gonna open up about this and I'm just gonna do it and it is what wow. it is and I gave the talk and like there were some people in the audience that cried and it was so like huge it was huge but it was that was a huge point like turning point um of like letting go and like that's not who I am and that's you know done and I've accepted it and moved on and things like that uh 
and I never tell that story because you know th- is that's just a choice that you know we I've decided to not take that path you know of that story but that being said we all have so many of those stories um inside of us because one teenage is horrible two you know there is no nobody's trained like I know family members who are struggling with mental health today yeah. and in 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 developed countries and everywhere around the world and being shamed for it or being like get okay like why can't you get okay right. and it's like <gasps> like you got to slow down like it's going to take time and you got to give people that time but that being said i love all that you said that you know your confidence is way deeper than you know just some tips and band-aids and tricks you know i mean it's all about knowing yourself more and then reconciling a lot of your past and once you do that then to your earlier point where you can now say okay you see i came up all those struggles of course i can do this you know i came up all these challenges of course i can do this but unless you reconcile it you know it's all like sitting around and you know not being looked at it just ignored and that just makes it really really worse yeah Yeah. And like, I think what's hard is when you keep repeating a story. So for me, I kept repeating that story of I don't belong here and that I'm not enough or that I'm too much, like all at the same time. And so I I think for me, the most powerful thing was realizing that I created that story. Like Mm -hmm. certain circumstances happened to me that helped me create those stories. And so I have grace and empathy for that young Janelle, that young, you know, I don't know where, you know, usually we have like one specific memory where we mm-hmm. actually attached ourselves to that story. And that could be, you could be four or five, six years old. You can be really young, but a lot of times people don't think of that story. They think of one of their stories where they confirmed it, right? So confirmation bias is looking to confirm a story that you've created. Uh, confirmation mm-hmm. bias could be like, if you're in the market for a Tesla, you go test drive a Tesla. And so all of a sudden Teslas are on your mind. And as you're yeah. driving around, you're like, oh my gosh, there's a Tesla, there's a Tesla. Oh my gosh, my neighbor has a Tesla. And you're seeing all these Teslas and it feels like there's more Teslas than ever before. But in reality, there are no more Teslas than before. Well, Tesla could be a slightly bad example, actually, (laughs) because there could be a few more than before. But um, likely from Monday, you test driving to Tuesday, there wasn't more, there weren't more, you just started to recognize them and look for them. And that's confirmation bias. And what we do as humans is once we attach a limiting belief to our brain, so like for someone listening, a lot of women that I work with struggle with, I'm not smart enough, right? Mm-hmm. Like that they don't think I'm very smart or, or maybe the limiting belief is straight up. People think I'm stupid. That's what a lot of women struggle with mm-hmm. is thinking that people think that they're stupid. And so you've created that limiting belief that people think you're stupid and you're looking for ways to confirm that in your day-to-day life. And I know because right. I, that was one of mine too. So then if you have a teacher in fifth grade or something that's like makes a comment like Janelle, like you sure do ask a lot of questions. Oh, and I was told that a lot. So that was one of mine. And I was <laughs> like, I was like, oh my gosh, she thinks I'm stupid because she mm-hmm. thinks I ask too many questions. Other kids aren't asking as many questions as me. I must be stupid. Then I go look for a more confirmation. Someone makes a little comment. They don't say, Janelle's stupid, but I think all I hear in my mind is, oh my gosh, they think I'm stupid. They think I'm stupid. They think I'm stupid. So I'm looking for ways to confirm that. So what I challenge everyone listening to do is what I challenge my clients to do. I challenge the women at my workshops to do. Start to reframe your brain. Start to repeat, Mm -hmm. I'm smart, and look for ways to confirm that you're smart. Now, maybe you'll get that from other people, or maybe you just have to give it to yourself like you finish a tough task at work and you're like, dang, look how freaking smart I am. I crushed it. And start to look for ways to co- confirm that, have that confirmation bias around smartness instead of looking for ways to think that you're stupid, even though no one's thinking that. You have a different frame of mind. And once your belief system becomes I'm smart, now, because I've retrained my brain on that, when people make comments, if they're if someone were to say the same thing to me, same tone, same person, the exact same scenario of, wow, Janelle, you sure ask a lot of questions. Might be like that. In my mind, I'm like, damn right I do. I'm curious and I am a learner and I am smart. And I was born like that. And it's pretty cool that I like to learn. And it's pretty cool. I like to ask questions because that is how you get better. And that's how you get smarter. So I'm smart. Mm-hmm. And that's cool. Thank you for the compliment. Thank you. Right. Yeah. And, and one more thing I'll say about that is like, you get to determine what's true and what's not true for you. So mm-hmm. I love this example, but like Prasha, if I was like, 
I hate your green hair. Your green hair is mm. so ugly. What would you say? I really don't care. Because <laughs> you don't have green hair, right? <laughs> I, I don't have green hair either, <laughs> but even if I did, <laughs> but, but I get right. your point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The point is like, you actually don't have green hair. So if I were to diss your green hair, it wouldn't attach to your identity because it's literally, you just don't have green hair, which if someone listening has, has green hair right. good for you, like live your best life. I'm just using that as an example. Right. Um, right. but like if someone says you're not smart, and you choose to believe that, then you let it hurt your ego and you let mm -hmm. yourself be sad about it. But if you truly believe that you're smart and someone were to make a comment about you not being smart, it's unattached to your ego because you're so set in who you are. And I think that takes time, yeah. but that is what's possible for confidence is framing your brain so much so that when people make those comments, you're actually unattached. And the even greater challenge is to be unattached both directions. Like if right. someone gives me an incredible compliment, it's like, oh, thank you so much. If someone gives me an incredible diss, it's like, okay, thanks so much. And it's being unaffected and on like whether someone gives a compliment or a diss, it's it's like I'm detached to your, your the outcome. I'm detached to your perspective of me because I know my perspective of me and I know my intention and I know my heart and I know yeah. that I'm here to help people and love on people. And if I do it incorrectly, then I'm, de I'm detached. And, and of course that again, it's right. imperfect. It's a, it's a work in progress. There are still things that people say that I'm sometimes Always, like, Oh, yeah. that sucks. I hate <laughs> hearing that. But then I'm but, like, okay, unattached yeah, from, but, their, from their opinion. Yeah, but I think also with because you keep practicing it, the the more you practice, the more space you can create, right? Between what other people think, and um, you know, this is a societal thing, every thing everywhere. Like women are judged on a higher standard than than men, and minorities in general are judged on a higher standard than than yes. than the majorities in any society. And uh, you know, these are some really great ways. And I think I'm I'm glad that. You know, when you talk about building your confidence muscle, it's like, okay, it's a deeper work, like it's understanding like who you are. And it's not as simple as, you know, like where we started with, with like, oh, just be confident or just do affirmations. It's like, no, there's like so much work that goes on. And I 100% agree with that because otherwise you risk uh, being, you know, um, you know, being insensitive or you risk being, you know, called that, um, that you risk being perceived as someone who's doesn't know much but is confident because then you lose credibility too so it's really important that you work on yourself make it a priority uh whether it's getting a therapist whether it's doing journaling whether it's you know reading books whatever helps hiring you a get coach started. i mean hiring yeah. a coach helps too you know <laughs> you like two two wonderful you got uh, two coaches, coaches here. right here who would love <laughs> to help you i'm just saying i mean i'm not gonna turn you away girlfriend i'm here for you uh, yeah no i agree, I agree. I, it's awesome i mean it, i think it's so good um to work on yourself because then you can add value to your society add value to your family add value to your life and it's a work in progress like you said it doesn't end it's not like because maybe you and I are an extrovert in your gram eight, maybe we are like, oh my God, every day you can do anything we want. But that being said, there's still so much work. And because you're constantly, you know, treading new waters, doing new yes. things. Um, and another tip that I think comes to mind, and you'd agree, I think, is that when you said that is like, these little challenges in your own life you can take up, right? So that, you know, you don't have to take these giant challenges and conference rooms and boardrooms. But but in your small life, like in your small perimeter, like where there are not too many people, you could start there, like, um, and and you could start like learning something new and trying to try new things where you're obviously going to fail because you don't know it. And then hopefully, you know, you get so attuned with learning that if you fail at work, you're like, okay, whatever, like I just learned something new, right? So you don't, to your point, I think non non attachment and non judgment. <laughs> Is, is the um, only reason we are all here to learn that. Uh, hopefully, we, we can keep making progress towards it. But it's really difficult, you know, uh, to to not identify with something or to not become part of like a compliment or a, uh, you know, or a rude remark. Um, but again, it's constant work. I don't I don't think you stop the work. I don't think I stop. I don't think anybody stops the work. Um, and that's what makes us even more confident because now we're like, I'm work in progress, you're work in progress, you know, this is awesome. But then there are people who think I am somehow going to be perfect one day. 
and LOL. then there's no space. <laughs> there's no space for anything else. So with that being said, like, what would you say to somebody who feels like no matter what they do, it's not enough? So like they never feel confident. Uh, is there anything quick that they could do, whether it's, you know, for me, it's like dressing up. <laughs> like if I'm not feeling confident, you know, I use makeup and things like that for as a SOS tool, like any day <laughs> I have a big meeting and I don't feel like myself, I'm like, okay, let's dress up. And uh, so what would be your some, uh, some tips around that, whether it's for high performing careers or for people, you know, just starting in their careers and things like that? Yeah, the first tip or tool that comes to mind that I have all of my clients do is make a list of 20 things you love about yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you're feeling like exactly how Prasha just said, you're probably like, um, I don't have 20 things I love about myself, about my personality. Like I can't even, I remember I had a client about a year and a half ago who I asked her to make a list and she could only think of three things to put on her list. Mm -hmm. And that broke my heart because I had known her for like two weeks and I could give her a list of 20 things that I loved about her personality. And so I think if you're in that spot where you literally can't even barely think of one thing you like about your personality. And by the way, with the list, I am talking about personality traits and not your, mm -hmm. not the things that you do, the things that you are. So your mm -hmm. career does not go on the list. Your, you know, if you're a mom, that doesn't go on the list. If you're a wife, that doesn't go on the list. It has nothing to do with your duties or your external things. It, they're things that are internal about you. But if you love being a mom or if you love your career, well, what are the things, the personality traits that you love about that? So if you are if you love your career, maybe you love that you're driven. So you could write driven mm -hmm. on your list. Um, maybe you love your team. I don't know. So maybe you care about people. So you're, mm -hmm. uh, a, a caring, you're caring. That would be the personality trait that you would put onto that. And so making a list of 20 things you love about yourself. And I think some external things could go on the list too. I always encourage a few external things. Again, women have the hardest time yeah. saying external things they love about themselves because we're so hard on ourselves, right? It's so easy to look in the mirror and look at like, like for me, like, instead of looking at my eyes, which I love my eyes, I will immediately look for like my pimples, like any new pimples popped up since I looked last. <laughs> and I'm like, Janelle, look at your eyes and like, look at your smile or look at things that you appreciate about yourself instead of immediately trying to find the flaw when you look in the mirror. So if you don't like your figure or your physique right now, you're not going to get more slender or, you know, have a healthy body and make healthy decisions based on beating yourself up. Because every time you look mm. in the mirror, you say like, you're so freaking fat. Like, let's go get on the treadmill. Like, that's not how you would speak to a child to motivate them to go do something that you want a child to do. Mm -hmm. And we're all just big children. So like, how can you love on yourself to actually motivate yourself? And man, I mean, I could go on and on and on about this because so many women think I had an email from a woman the other day who reached out to me and said, she doesn't want to ce celebrate her successes because she's afraid it'll make her lazy and that she'll stop mm -hmm. working so hard. And it's, it feels counterintuitive to slow down. It feels counterintuitive mm. to compliment yourself or compliment your body if you're not feeling confident about your body. Um, but in reality, by nourishing your soul and by nourishing your mindset and, and actually complimenting yourself before the results come, then you're actually going to be more likely to attract those results because you're coming from a place of encouragement and positive reinforcement as opposed to a place of negative reinforcement. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, easy, easy tool, write out 20 things. If you can't think of them, start asking your family, ask your friends. And I really do love the Enneagram personality test. Mm -hmm. Um, I find the Enneagram to be the most helpful of all personality tools. You can find, you can do strength finders. That's a great one. You can do Myers-Briggs or 16 personalities, which is the free version of that uh, Myers-Briggs, mm -hmm. or you can do the Enneagram. I do all three. If I'm feeling like, if I'm really feeling down on myself or if I'm trying to make a big life decision around, like, I remember when I was thinking about my career stuff a lot, I would, I would write out all of the characteristics that make me me and be like, okay, this is who I am. This is who I am. This is who I am. Like keep revisiting exactly who you were created as. And the more you can compliment and appreciate and love those strengths and those personality qualities that your creator gave you naturally, like you just came out 
of your, you know, your mother and you immediately just had these things like that's beautiful. These are your, these, you don't need to try to be someone else. It's like, it's all already inside of you. So that's like another thing with confidence. It's like, don't try to be like someone else's version of confidence. Like just be your version of confident because you're already, you're already beautiful. It's already like, sometimes my clients will say like, I, I, I'm trying to be like this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't need to try to be anything. Everything is already inside of you. Just be you just authentically be you. And and like, everyone will be so much happier. People don't want this like perfectly manicured version of you. Like people Mm. like the mess. Like when I do my speaking engagements, I'm like, I'm in front of corporate America, you know? And like, I'm the opposite of corporate America. I'm like, (laughs) I'm so unprofessional on so many levels. I'm just not that person. And I've never been, I can't, I'm like bad in the classroom. I couldn't sit still in class. I would be kicking down. (laughs) I'm like, I'm not here for the corporate thing. I'm not here for like, I'm, I'm just going to be a human. I'm just going to show up and be a human. And like, that's all I can be. And if you like it, awesome. If you don't, I'm sorry. Like I I can't be perfect for you. And I don't want to try to be, because it's way too much pressure to put on myself. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No, I think what the Bible says, know thyself, right? And it's not just Bible, but every religion around the world says the same thing. And the whole point is, if you could know yourself, then you could be yourself, and then it wouldn't be as complicated. So, um, so it's it's just so much deeper than confidence and and these little things like little things I say, but career, uh, which is a little thing in life, if you think about it, right? (laughs) In in the entire universe, uh, I follow this guru called Sadhguru, and he says, and there's this giant universe, and there's a small planet called called Earth, and that small planet, there's a small country called United States, and then inside the United States, there's a small town called whatever, and in that little town, you're a big person. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's how little your career is in the grand scheme of things. But that being said, um, I'm absolutely enjoying our conversation. I think we could go on and on and on um, (laughs) about confidence and all these wonderful concepts that are all sorts sort of entangled together and can be taught, you know, one without the other. Um, And with that being said, like, what would be your final advice on how can someone build their confidence uh, muscle in STEM and beyond? I think my biggest piece of advice would honestly be go to my website. I know this sounds cheesy. This is kind of, it sounds like a plug because it kind of is, but it's kind of not because I truly believe that overcoming your limiting beliefs, naming Mm -hmm. them, getting them out in the open, and then claiming your truth is the most important thing you can possibly do. And I have a free resource there that I give away. It's called the number one way to build your confidence muscle. And that is to, to read that. It's like a three page little mini you know, little mini book that I wrote for you and then some questions for you so you can dive into your own story. And like, I get it. You're listening to this either, you know, you might be watching live, which thank you so much for being with us on your Sunday afternoon. Um, Or maybe you're listening to this podcast and it's so easy. We've all done it. I know. I know we've all done it. Listen to a book or listen to a podcast that says, go do something afterwards. And we don't do it. So like, feel free to ignore me. You know, you don't have to listen, but if I could urge you go to the website, nextlevelconfident.com forward slash confidence muscle, grab that free ebook. And then it'll take you 30 minutes, set a 30 minute timer, Mm -hmm. put some Enya on, light a candle. Like that's my favorite. I always do Enya Mm -hmm. and a candle and a journal and just do 30 minutes, like a little date, date night with yourself. And explore what your limiting beliefs are. What are the lies that have tried to attack you for so long? And, and they'll keep new ones will keep coming or the same one will keep coming, Mm -hmm. but at least you have that. It's like, as soon as you bring it to your conscious mind, it's going to be so much easier to overcome it because you're not ignoring it. You're facing Mm -hmm. it dead on, you know, face your limiting beliefs dead on, and then start to appreciate, like I've said, those strengths and those God given things inside of you, um, make that list of 20 things that you love about yourself and get help on it. And, and you know what, here's one other little tip. Here's a tool. This is not, this is not the way to build your confidence, but this is a way when someone gives you a compliment, like say you're making Mm -hmm. your list of 20 things you can't think of, you only thought of 10 on your own. You need 10 more. So you go to your mom, you call your mom, she'll have some things to tell you, but like, mom, what do you like about me? What do you love about me? And she's like, Oh, honey, you know, you are just, you're so driven and you are so caring for people and whatever compliments she gives you. 
instead of like rolling your eyes or, or feeling that resistance that we often feel when Mm. someone starts to give us a compliment where we're like, no, 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 no. They're not talking about me. They're talking about someone else. Like that couldn't be true for me because I'm, I'm too this and I'm too imperfect and I make too many mistakes. And I was actually really mean to that person the other day. And so I know that I can't be that kind for people or whatever. And we try to resist the compliment. Yeah. I just want to urge you to take that moment and instead of thinking of all the reasons why you you aren't loving or you aren't kind or you aren't driven or whatever, just receive the compliment. And one great way to receive a compliment is by saying, thank you. I received that. Mm. Thank you. I received that. When someone gives me a compliment, I say, thank you. I received that. Instead mm-hmm. of trying to say, no, 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 no. Or, or this is another one that women do immediately try to compliment the other person back. Cause it's like, they're so uncomfortable with receiving a compliment. That's like, well, mm. and you know, and you're so awesome too. And it's so <laughs> inauthentic sounding. It's like, okay, well, she was giving you a real compliment. And now you're just sounding awkward trying to give her a compliment on the spot. Like yeah. you do people a disservice when you don't receive a compliment. So um, yeah. anyway, random side tangent rant that you can tell I'm very passionate about. <laughs> But um, receive the compliment. Like if someone gives you a compliment, just say, thank you. I received that. And it feels really good for both parties to just receive a compliment. Yeah. And that's so simple, though. You know, uh, it's such a simple thing. And I think because same thing like you said before, like if this is all going to add up to that new limiting beliefs, you know, bank or whatever you want to call it, where you're like, okay, I don't believe it yet, but this mm-hmm. person does. So now, okay, I have one data point. And, you know, for everybody in STEM, it's like, okay, we're always collecting data, right? So it's like, all right, so I have one data point. Like, can can I collect more data points to prove this hypothesis? Because right now you're proving a wrong hypothesis that I suck. And then (laughs) you have a lot of data to prove that I suck, right? (laughs) Oh, my gosh, I love that. It was so good. I love how you put that. So think about, like, really collecting all that data points. And then when somebody's giving you for free, they're saying you're awesome. Um, just again, accept it. And like you said, move on and use it in that new limiting beliefs, new affirmations, new ways of uh, training your mind. I love that. And then I have two last questions. One, what is your favorite book? Ooh, my favorite book. I read so many books at once and I also barely finish books. So, you know, there's that, but, um, Right now, my favorite book is The Go-Giver, and mm-hmm. I've read it like three times, and I'm reading The Go-Giver Sells More. Um, that one is my current favorite book right now. Yeah. That's awesome. But uh, do you know the author? Um, well, it's okay. It should be on my, <laughs> as you can see, the bookshelf back here, I'm like, it's probably That's on the awesome. bookshelf. I don't I know. I bookshelf. I don't know the author, but if you write no The worries. Go-Giver, it's... It's basically talking about the difference between a go-getter, which I can naturally be like, I'm a go-getter. And it's that go-getter is about like efficiency and getting a lot done. Whereas the go-giver is coming more from a space of love and presence and just caring for people and that you'll actually do better in business having the go-giver mentality than the go-getter mentality. Mm -hmm. So that's been a really important shift for me, especially as a, as an entrepreneur. So I think if you Google go-getter, You'll find it. I love it. Send the links. You can link it below. (laughs) I love that. That's awesome. And then last question, where can our audience uh, get in touch with you? Yeah, you guys can add me on LinkedIn, Janelle and a, or you can follow me on Instagram. I'm definitely, I'm trying to bring a little more weirdness to LinkedIn, but like, it's just hard. Like people, it's like a, a little bit more like, you know, like I said, it's a little bit more like be cool and stuff. And I'm so if you want to see my weirdness, follow me on Instagram. <laughs> now and then. You'll see me and my husband dancing in the kitchen with our dog on our shoulders or weird things like that. Um, and then, yeah, you can head to my website, nextlevelconfident.com to learn more about one on one confidence coaching. If you are interested in being coached by me, if you are, work for a STEM corporation and you think that some of the topics we're talking about today would be valuable for your team, you can hire me for a confidence workshop. And if you want to check out my podcast, the Next Level Confident podcast, um, you can find that everywhere podcasts are found. So, there's a lot of places to find me, but please connect and send me a, a message and let me know, you know, what your favorite thing was or send me your list of 20 things. Be like, guess what? You know, I did my journaling <laughs> homework. Here are my 20 things. Or guess what? I did my <laughs> limiting beliefs thing. Like here it is. So just reach out. Let me know. I would love to support yeah. you. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Janelle. And we learned so much. And thank you for being vulnerable with your story and sharing all these amazing tips. Um, if we just put to practice everything that we consume through through so much amazing content that everybody's putting out, our lives will be all set. Like, But uh, as you said, I hope we can uh, make people feel the need to actually urgently take action. And I think you've given us some great tools to get started. So thank you so much for taking the time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Well, thank you so much for having me, Prasha. And I love your podcast. I'm so proud of you. And I just want to acknowledge and celebrate everything that you have done to build this community, to build these women up. And like, it's not easy to do all the things that you are doing. And I just, I'm so proud of you. Like, I, you are truly a light in this space. So thank you for showing up and being yourself and empowering me and all the other women listening. Like you are incredible. Thank you for inspiring me. Thank you. I received that. <laughs> I'm yeah, putting it to wow, you. Wow, <laughs> let's go. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> And that was Janelle with her amazing story and some amazing tips on how you can build your confidence muscle. Join us again next week for a brand new episode. Until then, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And please make sure you join us for live streams every Sunday. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.